Born in Korea, Alice Stevens was among the first generation of transnational interracial adoptees. Her work has appeared in Urban Mosaic, Flung, Banana Writers, and the Washington Independent Review of Books, which publishes her monthly column, Aunt Alice in Wordland. She lives with her family and dog in the Washington, D.C. area. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. This is my, only my second reading. My book was just published October 16th, so please bear with me. Thank you. Yes! It took a long time to get it published. Uh, it's kind of a weird book. It's a great book, but it's weird. And um, if any of you are adoptees, I think you've got to read this book. Um, so I'm going to just read one passage. Um, this, is, this book is a story of Lisa Pearl who goes to Korea to find her birth mother. She's rather ambivalent about it. Um, she ends up getting uh, kidnapped and ends up in North Korea. Um, in between the story, I kind of stitch in um, re reflection, Lisa's reflections about being adopted. And so I'm gonna read one of those passages. I was used to being the only one of my kind in a room, the raisin in the oatmeal, as one tipsy dinner guest of my parents once put it. Even though there were a number of other Asians at my school, F-O-B-E-S-L kids, first generation overachievers, and a sprinkling of diplomat brats, I hung around with the white kids who were on the fringes, slackers, dirtbags, hippies, skater punks, emo kids, and all around oddballs. I was the only Asian and the only minority among them. It didn't feel weird to me because all my life I had been the only person of color in a sea of white, whether at family reunions, on a summer homestay in program in Spain, or at a raging kegger down the street from my house. In a psych class during my senior year, I learned about the Kubler-Ross model, otherwise known as the five stages of grief. At the time, I took it literally, useful only for the terminally ill and victims of tragedy, but if I'd had the acumen to apply it to my own situation as a transracial adoptee, I would have recognized that at age 17, I was three steps into the process. For the first decade or so of my life, I was swaddled in denial. Though I looked different on the outside, I blithely presumed that everyone, my family, neighbors, and classmates, knew I was just the same as they were on the inside. So I, turned out, so I tuned out the lady in line at the grocery store who asked my mom where she got me from, the business associate of Scott's who got all weepy-eyed over how my mom had rescued me. The young mother at the playground who squealed how she wanted one just like me. I ignored the strangers who oozed their unctuous blessings all over me, telling me how fortunate I was and how grateful I should be. Blocked out the compliments on how well I spoke English. Earnestly answered the snickering inquiries from my classmates about what I ate for dinner at home and how come I didn't eat my lunch with chopsticks. I thought that when Kirk Hobson pulled his eyes at me on the playground, it was no different from him making fun of the fat kid, the buck tooth kid, and the ginger. But then Tommy Feinstein took to yelling ching chong whenever he saw me. Wayne Goddard liked to follow me around chanting about dirty knees. And Jane Hahn, who I thought was my friend, asked me where my real parents came from. And it wasn't, in and it wasn't just white people. When I visited my father in Haberoni, kids would make karate kick moves at me screeching hi-ya and growling like cats in heat. Eventually, I could no longer ignore that my race was the first and sometimes only thing that people saw about me, and it was not I who was in control of my identity, but they. During my tweens, I moved on to the anger stage. Why should the shape of my eyes make Kirk, Tommy, and Wayne think they were better than I? I was obviously smarter than they were, and yet they got to make fun of me? But any insult I lobbed, I lobbed back at them was answered with a slur, which immediately, won the, uh, which immediately won the argument, according to the playground crowd. As I entered my teen years, boys began to tell me I was ugly because of my squinty eyes. They were only slightly worse than the boys who flirted by trying to guess which strain of Asian I was, or waxed ecstatic about how hot Asian girls were. The eyeshadow and mascara that the other girls applied looked frightful on me, drawing attention toward the narrowness of my eyes and their epicanthic fold. I began to parry the dreaded, where are you from, with America, but that just delayed the inevitable. 
that the Inquisitor would not be denied an explanation. No, I mean, where are you from originally? And then I'd have to admit that I wasn't really an American like they were. I was from Korea. Sometimes they'd ask how I came to America, and, and I'd have to confess to being adopted. I hated having to tell complete strangers the intimate details of my life as if I were some one-person exhibit in a freak show. I started to deliberately rebel against the stereotypes. Because I was supposed to be good at math, I failed geometry. Instead of being docile and obedient, I was troublesome and disruptive. Where I should have been straight-laced and demure, I was sloppy drunk and in-your-face outrageous. Though I was an indiscriminate consumer of illicit substances, it was alcohol that brought out the best, as I saw it, in, as I saw it then, in me, because nothing says, I don't give a fuck, like puking into a storm drain in broad daylight on a school day. <laughs> my final years of high school, I seize on all things Asian, grabbing indiscriminately, turning my ethnicity into a parody of an identity. I bedecked myself with jade rings, Buddhist prayer bracelets, good luck Chinese coin earrings, dragon embroidered Mary Jane slippers, padded silk jackets, bright satin brocade Chong Sam blouses, and a mal cap emblazoned with a red star. I dyed my auburn hair black, sharpened the angles of my page boy cut, used eyeliner to emphasize the slittiness of my eyes, and whitened my face with rice powder. When I found out that Vincent Chin, a Chinese immigrant whose murder by two white men galvanized the birth of the Asian American civil rights movement, was adopted, I built a sh small shrine to him in my bedroom, before, before which I burned incense every day, which also helped to cover up the pot smoke. I dropped Spanish for beginning Chinese, briefly joined the manga club, but couldn't give two fucks about Naruto and Dragon Ball, and then tried the Asian Student Union, but felt embarrassed and out of place among the real Asians. I scoured libraries and bookstores for Asian literature, reading Yasunara Kawabata, Yukio Mishima, Lu Xun, Mao Dun, Amy Tan, and Maxine Hong Kingston. I rented videos of films by Kurosawa, Ozu, and Zhang Yimou. I didn't consciously avoid Korean culture. It was just that Chinese and Japanese cultures were much more prominent and accessible. And anyway, it wasn't about exploring my roots, but about exploiting them. An inside joke, a sarcastic sneer. Call it my bargaining stage. Thank you, Alice. Um, so next is Julaine Lee. Julaine Lee was given up for adoption in South Korea as a result of the Korean War. She was adopted by an all-white Christian family in Minnesota, where she grew up. She has spent over 15 years working with overseas adopted Koreans. She lived in Seoul and now resides in Los Angeles, where she is a member of the LA What Balistas and Adoptee Solidarity Korea, Los Angeles. She is also part of the Adoptee Rights Campaign, working to pass the Adoptee Citizenship Act to ensure all inter-country adoptees have U.S. citizenship. Not My White Savior is her first book. Welcome, Julaine. North of the 38th, or Mr. Obama, please apologize. North Korea, the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Bukchosan, a nation misunderstood, misrepresented by mainstream media politicians, a United Nations member for over two decades. This wounded animal publicly skewered on the axis of evil, an outpost of tyranny quietly removed from the US of A's terrorism list. North Koreans long for reunification, peace on the peninsula, a strong, prosperous nation, one Korea, no North, no South, 
no east, no west. North Korean soldiers protect us at the DMZ, the more peaceful side of the 38th parallel. North Koreans, the first Koreans to accept me, despite my background, refusing to sell their children to white Westerners, caring for their own from cradle to grave. 1866, the General Sherman attacked Korea but was destroyed. 1968, USS Pueblo spy ship captured, the first time the US government apologized to another nation. Between these histories lies the worst incursion of them all, the worst because of its horrific intensity, the worst because of its secrecy, never rectified, no resolution between the DPRK and the US. 1950, the Korean War begins. The U.S. invades Korea. Sinchon, North Korea. Over 38,000 Korean civilians, women, children, massacred by U.S. military in 52 days. Mass murdered in churches, buried while breathing, butchered beyond recognition. Two thousand people pushed off the Soktong Bridge, mothers and children separated, burned after a petroleum bath. 38,000 killed. 50 days equals 25% of the population, equals 738 per day, equals 37 per hour, equals one Korean every two minutes. Images from Auschwitz, Birkenau, Dachau, till slang surface as I check myself. No, I am not in Poland. I am in, not in Germany. I am not in Cambodia. I am in Korea. Is this your killing fields, your Holocaust? I ask a survivor. It is worse, he replies, as the painting of his tortured father hangs in the massacre museum. Unexcavated mass graves, the Commission of the Women's International Democratic Federation finds these atrocities surpass those committed by Hitlerite villains. Ugandan, Japanese brothers and sisters fight for justice, get out, U.S. Army, Korea is for Koreans. Lay flowers at graves of mothers, children, meet two survivors who escaped as boys. Jong Kun Song, age six. Ju Song Won, age five, now grandfathers, museum guides, stand in the very place they were to die. Recount the horrific event, some of the last survivors to testify this atrocity. Students wait to pay respect, our time too short. Shouldn't we take more time to pay respect? No, then this infinite line of mourners cannot. Students stream through the museum, into the bunker, back out of the battery, who cared for the children who survived. The state, the state gave them a place, status in society, valued them, cared for them, instead of selling them to white Westerners. Is this why the US cannot apologize for this shameful history? This history is not taught in US classrooms. It is not taught in South Korea but it is taught tonight. Mr. Obama, Mrs. Clinton, please rectify the past. Apologize on behalf of your predecessors and this country you call the greatest nation in the world. Yes, you can. So I wrote that piece after I went to North Korea with the 2011 peace delegation that Noruto um, organized and some of the members of that delegation are here tonight. So I um, was quite shocked to learn of this when I went to um, the Massacre Museum and um, I think it's a very, very emotional day. Um, but I encourage you to find out more about that history of ours that we don't always know about. Um, so I mean, there's been a lot of, I'm adopted and there's been a lot of news lately about reunification. It's always been something very interesting to me. The first time I went back to Korea in 2001, we did a visit to the DMZ from the South and it was an incredibly um, emotional day. And I remember standing there thinking like, this is why I'm even here. 
Um, and so with all the talks about reunification and peace, it's, it's great, but I think what is missing from those conversations and that analysis is that if the Korean Peninsula reunifies between North and South, how does South Korea and the North, how do they um, reckon with themselves in having intentionally divided almost 200,000 families through intercountry adoption and not facilitating our reunions in a very friendly manner? So this is called Open Letter to the Korean Red Cross. Dear Korean Red Cross, our commendations, 4,000 family reunions between North, South, Vigilance, innovation, connects families face to face. Letters, videos, 75,000 families wait since 1953. Sober reunions, fleeting mo moments, sorrowful hello goodbyes. But for us, no trace, effort to reunify 200,000 families. Korean War divided South Koreans between East West. 200,000 families ignored, waiting since 1953. Korean language lost, sabotaged reunions, negligence, switched children, tampered DNA tests. You will be charged with war crimes, civilian property destroyed, birth records lost, foreigners took us hostage. When do 200,000 ignored West East Union reunions begin? We die every day. Convoys of planes travel west to east. Without hope, we wait. Please respond before we're extinct. So with some of the news coverage with the peace talks, and I saw that um, President Moon Jae-in you know, was planting a tree at the border with um, Kim Jong-un. And I thought, well, where is the tree for overseas Korean adoptees. Um, last summer, before he took office officially, in between Park Geun-hye being um, impeached, there was an open period where you could submit to his administration um, different issues that you felt might be important for him to pay attention to. So there was a coalition of us that submitted a declaration to end um, industrial um, adoptions from South Korea. Um, I feel it was very symbolic that a number of Korean nationals also signed the petition and um, it was translated into Korean as well. Um, we have not heard a response. We kind of don't expect to, but it's a living document. Um, you can find it online. I think it's um, important that we do that. Um, so there's, you know, a little bit of anger in this book. My publisher said, you know, when we, we were talking about, like before, you know, contract, they said, we like all the anger. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to, um, you know, maybe have a little, you know, bit of some other emotions in here and kind of imagine like what could be. And um, so I took this workshop where they asked us to think of a, um, superpower and so the superpower I chose was teleporting because if I had to tell if I could teleport I wouldn't have had to take an overnight plane last night from the West Coast and we would just have no traffic to deal with traffic jams so this is called teleporting babies and this will be the last piece I read imagine a world where Korean babies could teleport when white Christian agencies abduct them they can return to their original families what if their $30,000 purchase price were invested in a trust in their name? Money would grow on ginkgo trees, liberate unwed mothers and their children, smash single mom stigma, take over National Assembly bedrooms. No need for 20-week protests, impeachment, Teleporting babies would have stopped Park geun -hye voting booths, her father overthrown into his Han River regime. Teleporting babies would rule the Korean Peninsula forever, kick out the U.S. imperialist army, reunite North brothers and sisters, families divided between East and West, because teleporting babies know what's best for themselves, their people, the world. Trust me, they told me this. Teleporting babies know stealing them from young poor mothers is not in their best interest. Teleporting babies love everyone, not just the rich, powerful, white. Teleporting babies would rule every continent. Baby silence 
doesn't equal agreement. It means we're planning our world domination. So love will dominate. So peace will dominate. Thank you. Thank you, Julaine. Um, next is Eugenia Kim, who is the daughter of Korean immigrant parents who came to America shortly after the Pacific War. Her first novel, The Calligrapher's Daughter, won the 2009 Borders Original Voices Award. She is an MFA graduate of Bennington College and has published short stories and essays in journals and anthologies, including Asia Literary Review and Raven Chronicles. She currently teaches at Fairfield University's Low Residency MFA Creative Writing Program. Welcome. I want to thank you for coming, really. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'm going to read for a few minutes. About 10 years ago, I learned from a Korean cousin that my, my, that my maternal grandmother had no toenails. She had lost them to frostbite as a result of bringing food every day to my mother in prison. My mother lived in Japanese-occupied Seoul. She was arrested December 8, 1941, the day after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, suspected of being a spy because her husband was studying theology in America. She was imprisoned for 90 days, not allowed to see my grandmother during those brutal winter days. But in the bottom of each rice bowl, my grandmother would secrete a Bible passage or message written on rice paper, which helped sustain my mother throughout her ordeal. My mother never learned that my grandmother lost all her toenails from the two-hour track to the, to the prison and back. My mother and grandmother had always been close but my grandmother's daily sacrifice to feed her daughter made them closer still. Recovering from frostbite is a slow and painful process. So my, mother's, my grandmother's quiet stoicism is the stuff of family legend. Their closeness may be the root of a fateful decision that altered many lives, which in turn was the heart of the inspiration for the kinship of secrets. Years later, my sister in Seoul was separated from our family in America for 10 years because of a choice that demonstrated the great love and bond between my mother and grandmother. I clearly remember when my sister's son joined our family in Washington, D.C. in 1958. She was 11 years old and had left everything she'd ever known to come to the U.S. alone on a plane with nothing but a small wooden figurine. She was so terrified about having to use the airplane bathroom that she didn't eat or drink anything on the long, on the long overseas <coughs> flight. She would join our family of five other children and parents whose hearts had yearned for this daughter for a long decade. Assuming all immigrants were thrilled to come to America, it was only as an adult that I asked my sister what it was like to have made that trip. Her answer stunned me. It was the blackest day of my life, she said. I needed to know her story. After the Pacific War ended in 1945, my father was reunited with my mother in Seoul. They adopted one daughter, had son, and then a baby boy. By 1948, my father's job ended, and he was free to plan an extended trip to the US for his nuclear family. But my grandmother was distraught, certain they would never return. And so it happened that my parents decided they would leave one child with my grandparents and uncle for a year or so while they traveled in America. At three, the eldest daughter seemed too old, too sensitive to parental separation. My brother was an infant not yet weaned. As my father put it, son, the middle child, was too young to appreciate the trip, but old enough to be independent from her mother. Had they left the adopted child in Korea, grandmother would have believed that they could more easily abandon her. The decision to leave son was a guarantee that they would return, and one that demonstrates the deep bond between my mother and grandmother. 
Your decision came to haunt my parents when the war broke out on the Korean Peninsula on June 25, 1950, and my parents lost touch with their family in Korea for six months. A photo from a year before that shows how my mother yearned for her missing daughter by cutting and pasting her image onto a family portrait. Because we were five years apart in age, my sister and I were not particularly close. I knew little of her life before she joined ours, and in the way of families who have secrets, never thought to ask. On my first trip to Seoul in 2005 with Sun, I saw the deep ties she shared with my uncle. They mostly wept together when, reconstruct, when recounting the past, and I finally asked her what it was like to have come to America and received that surprise answer, that it was the darkest day of her life. She told me that for every night for two years after her arrival, she had dreamed of returning home to Seoul. She faced a new family who, whom she knew only by, whom she knew only by photographs and letters and packages. She faced a new culture and a new language, a new school, a new future, and a new country all unwillingly. That is the story that inspired this novel. That, and given this truthful family story, from my grandmother's toes to my sister's despair, to convert it to fiction had its special challenges. What do you cut that will still maintain the honor of the story given to you? What do you keep? What is needed to be added out of whole cloth to make this story dramatically whole? It was a constant balancing of these questions for the seven years it took to write this book. So I'm going to read from a section this far in. <laughs> Inja, who is the son character, and her family have fled from the battles in Seoul during the Korean War, and they have found themselves in a refugee camp. They had left their cook and her daughter behind, thinking it would just be a few weeks and then they would return. Uncle went back to Seoul to see if he could find them. A girl has stolen Inja's American sneakers, and overnight someone stole a prized bedpan that Inja's mother had sent from America when she learned that grandmother had had a stroke last summer. Aunt is furious at the theft. Aunt flapped the quilt and yelled at her to find out who stole the bedpan. Inja tugged on dry socks and her rubber shoes, her face sour. Aunt shoved her hip and said, do as you're told. What kind of child acts like that? It's no wonder your mother left you behind. Her usual rant and one impossible to ignore. Inja plowed through the bundles piled beneath the overturned cart, resentful and certain Aunt wouldn't have said that if Uncle were around. She skirted people's camps and sloshed through puddles. Fat raindrops splashed her neck as she looked for gleaming white enamel or a flash of blue sneaker. She tripped on a root and pain surged through her toe. She seethed at her thin rubber shoes, that thief of a girl, and swore to stray all day to avoid aunt, though her stomach rumbled. After she used the latrine, she dawdled at the warehouse's cavernous opening, addled enough by anger to want to beat up the girl who stole her shoes. Then. Far beyond the pump, she glimpsed a familiar white oblong and strode toward it with purpose. There was the bedpan, balanced on stones over a small fire, a woman stirring something in it. Inja neared and smelled onions and soy sauce in its smoke. She ran back to Aunt. I found it, come and see. Aunt followed her, fingers curled like a hawk's talons. But when she saw the woman cooking with the bedpan, she stopped and clutched Inja's shoulder. Hush, let's go back. At their camp, grandmother fanned embers beneath the old iron cook pot, boiling water. In the other pot, fresh barley rice had been shaped into balls. Aunt told her about the bedpan. That poor woman didn't know better. We can't say anything now. Grandmother agreed they'd make do without it. Then they snickered, heads lowered. She'll wonder why her soup tastes so delicious, said Aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until Cook hears about that special seasoning, said Grandmother. And they laughed aloud, mouths covered in modesty. In this desperate place where people stole things, certain manners, such as saving face, 
even for strangers and thieves, still mattered. Inja had wearable shoes, and the family had two cook pots. They could forego a prized bedpan and a coveted pair of sneakers. Later that morning, Inja spread blankets out to dry, pumped buckets of water, and grandmother showed her how to lay hot compresses on grandfather's back. Then aunt told her to do what she wished as long as she stayed out of trouble. She ran in the steamy fields all afternoon with other children playing war and looked in vain for the girl who stole her shoes. Uncle stumbled back to their camp after midnight and Inja crawled from bed to give him a relieved hug. Covered in soot, his clothes smelling of metal and smoke, Uncle's eyes were empty shadows in the firelight. Aunt shooed Inja back to bed, and the flickering cast by the fire and their quiet talk drew her into a sleep layered with sadness that neither Cook nor Yun had been rescued from Saul. Thank you. And now we're going to have a conversation. So um, please, you are welcome to sit on this couch. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, the readings and the discussion that you've already pre presented is so complex and wonderful. I guess the first question um, was inspired by all of your books, but also an essay Alice wrote for Lit Hub that begins with, it is human nature to make sense of the world by creating stories, and then follows with, but as an adoptee, I had to construct my own story. All of your books contemplate the idea of being chosen or relinquished. Um, how, do you, how do your essential characters and speakers reflect on that catalyst choice? Ahead, In any order. Um, how do they reflect on being chosen? Or, okay. um, well, my, my character doesn't really think too much about her adoption um, experience. She just, um, she's just kind of drifting through life. Uh, but she has identity problems because of it, but she doesn't want to face them. Um, and she doesn't really think about what happened or why. She goes to Korea to find her birth mother only because her best friend goes to Korea to find her birth mother. And she's just kind of following in her orbit. And that is kind of her, um, that's her problem. And, and maybe it was my problem too as an adoptee for a long time. I just kind of drifted in life. I didn't want to face what I had, you know, the, the pro what it meant to be adopted. Um, I had a, a very good adoption experience. M my family is great, and I had a great childhood. Um, but there was something in me that was a little broken and that didn't know um, how to face my emotions, how to deal with um, a lot of the problems that I faced as an interracial adop adoptee. My um, family has, uh, I have three bio biological, I have three siblings who are the biological uh, children of my parents, so I was the only uh, Asian in the family. Um, and as I said in my, in my reading, in my neighborhood pretty much, in my uh, class, um, I w it wasn't until my late 20s that I met another Korean adoptee. Um, and when uh, I was adopted, adoption was still kind of a dirty, secret that people didn't want to talk about. Um, so there were just all of these emotions that, um, that I kept clamped down. Um, and then when she decides not to, decides to go to Korea to look for her birth mother, she doesn't really believe it. And then that's kind of how she gets into her situation in the end. 
Inja thinks of her uh, biological family as, um, as her, her family in America as ghost people. She's only seen their photographs and received packages and letters from them. So she can't really imagine what they're like, even by being with her own um, family, her, her uncle and her aunt and her grandparents in Korea. She can't imagine a, a, an American family. Uh, so she pretty much just doesn't think about it until she has to. So my book is a memoir and poems. It is poetry, but much of it is about my personal experience. Some of it is also more collective or speculative, like the teleporting babies. Um, there's another, I mean, <laughs> if I could memoir. teleport, That's if I could memoir. teleport. <laughs> but there's another piece in there called My Ancestors Were Royalty. And I mean, whenever people talk about ancestors, you know, I get some anxiety around that sometimes because I think even if you are an adoptee in reunion with your original family, um, People have told me like even that can cause some anxiety just because you've met your Korean family or your original family. Um, there is one piece as well though that is a persona poem um, from the perspective of someone who does not have citizenship and has been deported back to Korea because that's an issue that's um, pretty important in our community right now. And so even though that is not my situation, I do have my citizenship, I can't even begin to imagine what it must be like to be you know, an inter-country adoptee and then kind of by accident find out that you don't have U.S. citizenship and then be deported. Um, so I I wrote that piece to bring attention to that issue, but also um, kind of my own way to process, like, that could have been me. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, my next question um, was inspired by how all of your books dare to go to the more complicated, daring places. You talk about the DMZ and um, kind of the Western information of North Korea. Um, your, your book is, I kept looking up and saying, wow, on the subway. <laughs> and um, in your book, uh, the father works for Voice of America and the mother was a midwife for a period of time, and um, there's talk of rebellion and the student uprising. So what inspired you to choose the subject matter and go to those places? For me, it was the Korean history itself. So um, when I started this particular book, I knew nothing or very little about the Korean War. So the more that I read, the more that I realized that and this was true for the calligrapher's daughter as well, is that when you write story in, in a historical context, history influences us every day. And so how would this history that I'm learning about influence these people's lives? And so that's, that's how, and, and some, some, some historical events would have great influence, like a war or a huge uprising um, that would affect a nation. And some would have very minor influence, so it's a matter of choosing and wh what kind of influence would it have on this nuclear family. Um, I wanted to write uh, the adoption story that I, the adoption novel that I had never found. Um, I looked, I, re I read a lot of, of uh, adoption novels. Um, I'm a book reviewer and I've read a lot of the recently published, uh, there's been a big trend in publishing dealing with it. Um, and I was uh, disappointed and upset that all of the stories were the same and they were where they made the adoptee the object and not the subject of the story. And so I wanted to uh, write, a, write a, the novel, an honest novel that uh, overturned the traditional narrative of adoption, which is bullshit, and um, you know, have the adoptee be the hero of her own story. Bullshit, yes. <laughs> um, so I felt, so November, if you didn't know, November is National Adoption Awareness Month. And um, it's been a time where adoptive parents will celebrate adoption. And in recent years, what we've seen on social media is that a lot of adoptees are taking this as an opportunity to use the hashtag flip the script and write our story and share our truth, and which we do all the time, but kind of an emphasis on it this month, um, that while there are many opportunities that adoption may have provided someone, 
doesn't come without some loss or some you know challenges with mental illness or different things for some people i'm not saying that's true for all adoptees but that those are some themes in our community and i felt like for myself growing up i was often told how lucky i was that i was adopted i was told that i was told by my mother that we paid a lot of money for you i was told a lot of things that you'll find if you read read the book like if we hadn't adopted you you'd be living a life of prostitution on the streets of korea these are direct quotes i cannot make this up and I'll, so the whole time like i'm feeling like i have to be thankful i have to be thankful i'm lucky i'm lucky i'm lucky and but yet not that wasn't 100 percent how i felt there were all these other emotions so i felt like it's very important to be authentic and um, one of my aunts she said i'm really glad you wrote this because you needed to tell your story and she, she shared my book with somebody at work and they were like, wow, she's pissed. <laughs> and it's like, but I don't, you know, somebody asked me like, well, has it helped you like get beyond your anger and move past it? And it's like, I don't think there's any getting past it. It's just way it's, now I feel like it's shared with everybody and it's not like I have to bottle it in. Like you, you got to experience it tonight, you know, right? So, you know, I think it's important to be authentic. And feeling angry can be nice sometimes. <laughs> Um, all of your books examine prominent relationships with a component of envy or complicated opposition. Um, in The Kinship of Secrets, there is this constant awareness of a sister in another land. And um, in your book, Alice, there is the relationship with Mindy, who is the beautiful doctor best friend. And in your book, there is a poem called Jealousy that talks about um, the mother's gaze. Um, could you talk a bit about the idea of a self that is formed within a complicated relationship and under the gaze of another? This book is called The Kinship of Secrets um, because that, that relationship is the core of what happens in the story. And because they don't really know each other until they're 16 years old, um, a lot of speculation happens on both sides of the on both sides of the world. So, without revealing too many secrets, <laughs> although I think you will reveal one later, <laughs> which is fine. Um, Well, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> Take your time. I think it's virtually impossible to have a relationship with someone that you don't know, you know, who, who with whom you are bound in certain ways. So you have this you have this you are committed to a relationship that you know nothing about really, the other person. So so the easiest thing to do is to ignore it. Um, and yet, it keeps coming back with every package she receives, with every letter she receives. There's always this uh, reminder. And because she's so living her own life in Korea, and Miran is living her own life in America, it doesn't feel like a bond. It feels like a threat. It's like, how is this going to change everything that I know? Um, I think all adoptees have um, relationships with unknown people uh, who are the, peop the family that they come from. And there are speculative relationships because you don't know who they are. Um, and you kind of imagine um, you have to make your own, the own, your own story about where you came from. And um, when you think about your it's usually the birth mother that you think about. Though I also do think about my birth father because he's an American. And um, I, he's always been the person that I thought I could understand the most if I went to look for my birth family. It would be my birth father that I'd want to find. I'd be able to talk to him. I'd be able to understand you know, his American way of thinking. Um, and so... Uh, it, it just both of those relationships are are always kind of they're not in the back of your mind and they don't they don't control your life or anything but there is that sort of 
tendency to think about them and then create stories about it. And you wrote a great essay in Lit Hub called Who's, Who Are the Villains of My Adoption Story? And if you're adopted, I encourage you to read it because I thought it was a great writing prompt. Like I, I'm going to read it again, but as you were asking the question, I was actually thinking of that poem, Jealousy, so it's <laughs> ironic that that's the one that you mentioned. But I mean, that's a real situation. I'll never forget that exchange when I was told by my white mom, well, I was jealous of you. And it's like, okay. It sounded like the jealousy was still there. And hearing that, but not knowing that for so many years, but hearing that directly, it explained a lot of things. Um, and that particular poem, though, I mean, when I was writing the book, I knew like, I wanted to write different poems about different things and so on. But I had no idea that that poem even existed. And it came out in a workshop. Um, but I, I think it was, again, like that, I've never been able to talk about it in, except in that poem. Um, but I think it was important, again, to be authentic. Um, Aspen Mattis, who wrote the memoir um, Girl in the Woods, I believe is the title of it, she was um, raped on campus her second night in her freshman year. And her family didn't really want her to talk about it, but she wrote a book. She like dealt with it in the way that she needed to. And I heard her speak about, like, how do you write about things that maybe other people don't want you to. And, you know, she kept saying kind of this, you know, different, same thing, but in different ways. And then she finally said, authenticity sings. And every time I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't write this or that. I just remembered those two words that she said, and it's never left me, authenticity sings. And I was like, I just have to, that was kind of been like part of my guiding, like, truth. In the spirit of authenticity, um, you spoke of kind of unknown threats. And I feel like as we move forward in your um, mo memoir and poems, um, it becomes more and more political. And then in both of your books, there is uh, a moment of introduction or gaining of knowledge. Do you feel like your characters and speaker grow wiser as these unknown threats are revealed? Yes, I mean that's the <laughs> that's the whole uh, point of my book is that it's it's this uh, adoptee's journey to to um, coming to terms with her own identity. Um, so she, um, you know, she has to she has to realize things, look back on her life, think about how things have gone um, to to uh, become the person that she needs to be. She has to confront her past and uh, know what, know why she has kind of gone off the rails in order to go back on the rails. Wisdom is a tough thing um, to talk about. I think that the char what, what wisdom comes from for these characters is in the Kinship of Secrets, the wisdom comes from the acknowledgement that um, something, it's, it's not the outside influence, it's not the other sister, it's not the knowledge that they didn't have, it's not the reunion, it's none of those things. It's what's happening inside of them that changes uh, and gives them the wisdom. And it's also, the wisdom comes from an understanding of what love is. Both um, love of your sibling and as a result of that, then self-love. I think it's important, I, you know, people have said often that if you, if you don't tell your own story, if you don't write your own story, somebody else will tell it for you and it will probably not be the way you would have told it. It won't be authentic, it won't be accurate. Um, and so I remember the first time I went back to Korea in 2001 and I went to the War Memorial and, in Seoul and I was getting, it's chronological, and so I was getting to the part where okay, here should be something about overseas adopted Koreans. And there was nothing, nothing. And I just stood there and I was sad and I was angry and I felt also very helpless, like there's nothing I can do about this because I can't even speak the language. And so I feel like that's partly why it's important for um, anyone whose your narrative is missing in like, 
contemporary or historical um, places, whether you're, you know, you're not, you're not even, we don't even exist, that it's important for us to write our narratives. And it doesn't all have to be the same, um, but I think we need to write our stories so that we do exist. I mean, we, we do exist, but I mean, so that it, I think it validates us in another way. Yeah, and they, they aren't all the same. I mean, we're all individuals. We all have our own stories. And there are, you know, God knows how many, a million adoptees out there. And we all have our own individual stories. And yet, when you look at literature, you look at movies, you look at films, it's all the same story, you know? So the, there just needs to be more diversity. And, and adoptees need to be able to tell their stories, no matter how uncomfortable it makes people. So true. Um, so, all of well, you talk about the DMZ and going to um, Korea, and your book takes place in North Korea, um, <laughs> and your your book is this comprehensive historical journey. Um, what was your research and writing process? Well, I talked a little bit about um, the research done, but the actual research was mostly about reading, reading whatever I could get my hands on in English about the Korean War. And one of my greatest resources was a thick book called The Korean War in translation. So it was almost a day by day, hour by hour um, explanation of what happened in the war from the Korean perspective. And so, you know, because you read the American ones and they're very slanted. Um, and also s somewhat ignorant ab about the culture. So to read that one, that one book in particular really changed the way that I thought about uh, the war and how the people would have reacted to it. So, so, I mean, they even had the transcript of the news report from three days in that I used in The Kinship of Secrets. So, um, so that was the kind of, that's how the research influenced the book. And, um, and it was a joy to do it. You know, to learn something new is always just so rewarding. So the reading and then the having, you know, thank God, the internet, um, which is an amazing, an amazing tool. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't have to research the adoption part at all, but um, North Korea I did. And um, I read books as well. I've always been fascinated with North Korea. I've been fascinated with how um, you know one tiny minority can control a whole country, um, and just sort of that that the you know you see the the um, Americans see saw um, when Kim Jong Il died how everybody was wailing and crying and they're laughing like ha ha look at those people they're ignorant fools and. Um, you know, they, there's a story behind that. They're not ignorant fools. They're, they're, they've been shaped by this incredible propaganda machine. Um, so that, that's a theme not just um, for North Korea, but also for adoptions because, adoptees, because we've also been shaped by this propaganda, you know, the, this, this way of looking at, at things that um, isn't, um, you know, it's one narrow way, and that's, we're told that's the truth, and we have to find for by ourselves how to, you know, think outside that box. Um, but in terms of research, I read a lot of books. Um, I read about, you know, the, the um, Barbara Deming one, um, Nothing to Envy. I read a very valuable resource was um, uh, Paul Fisher's a Kim Jong-il production, which talks about kidnapping. I mean, I have a lot of, there's a lot of bizarre stuff in my book about North Korea, and it's all true. You know, it, North Korea is a really bizarre place, and, and these, weird things happen. Um, I read history books, um, and I also use, the, use YouTube. There's, um, there's some guy, I don't even know what his nationality is. He's not American or Korean, and he's, he goes around, he lives in Pyongyang, and he goes around and just um, records himself in his daily life in Pyongyang. So he went to the Paradise uh, department store, which is in my book. Um, and he just gave me an idea of like everyday life on the street. There are lots of documentaries that you can see as well. Um, and um, there is, uh, I also found, I, it wasn't the same guy, but um, the Kaesong Youth Park, which I have in my book, which is uh, Kim Jong-un's little, um, one of his pet projects, which is a uh, entertainment park. 
I found that on YouTube too. Um, if any of you have been or go on a KEEP trip to South Korea or North Korea with NODATO, so KEEP stands for Korea Education Exposure Program. Um, before we went to North Korea, we studied for, I don't know, three, four months, some pretty intense, like I think I, after I printed everything out, it was like this thick, plus a few books. Um, um, not just the history and what led up to the Korean War, but also current era and Korea Policy Institute right now actually has a reader, of, I think it's still available, that has um, some good information as well. And um, I, okay, now I lost my train of thought. But um, I mean, I think, I think all, yeah, right? There's so many thoughts. But I mean, I think actually like going to the museum, the first um, poem that I read and, you know, there's lots of great documentation that was there that we were able to see. And I think you can actually find some things online as well. But some of the readings that we um, that were required in our preparation were um, things by Bruce Cummings, um, Martin Hart Landsberg. And if you have any interest in having more resources, you know, I think if you talk to anybody from Nodatol and start going to some of their meetings, perhaps, you can probably get even more um, connected to some of those resources. Um, as far as... Um, like there's a host of information about Korean adoption as well on um, online. Um, so I think there's again the internet is a great resource for things, but it's you know it's taking the time to go find that information. I also want to add that I interviewed my sister. It is her story. So um, we spent. Luckily, we're very close now. So we spent a lot of time talking, um, and she told me, you know, many, many, many stories. Uh, and also we went to Korea together and she showed me Busan, where she had grown up during the war. So all those were incredibly valuable experiences. I love the mention of the internet because in your book, I won't give too much away, but the internet kind of saves. <laughs> um, all of your books take such different forms. Um, a poem, a memoir, and poems. Um, your book is of a very surreal kidnapping and um, fascinating hostage situation, and yours is inspired by um, a true story. Could you talk about your varied forms and why you chose them to tell the story? Because this was my sister's story, um, it was paramount to me to be able to honor her story in a way that would um, both respect it and respect her. So if I, I, when I wrote The Calligrapher's Daughter, I thought that I might write that as a nonfiction. But what I discovered in the process of trying to write that out, because it's my, fam my mother and father's story, was that the only way to really tell the emotional truth of that story was to tell it through fiction. So I already had that experience, so I knew that fiction would be the way to tell the story as well in order to convey the, the, the integrity of, the, of her life story and also of the relationship between the sisters. Um, so. Uh, the first book that I wrote was a historical fiction novel. Um, I thought it was really good, and it didn't, it didn't get picked up. And so I said, okay, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to write, I'm going to write a really great book that's going to get published. And I'm going to write about adoption, because that's what I know. I'm going to write my adoption story. And um, so it just came out really quickly, and it was really just... You know, at first it wasn't like I'm going to tell the, you know, I'm going to break open the, the tradition, I'm going to, you know, shake up the tradition of uh, adoption narratives. It was just, this is the story I have inside me, and it's a damn good story. I'm going to write it, and people are going to go, wow, and everybody's going to want to publish it. Nobody wanted to publish it. It took me four years to get it published. Um, and I think it was really because, again, um, there, there's such a, a trend of looking at adoption as the sentimental, lovely, um, you know, just beautiful story about the, the infinite capacity of the human heart to love. And they don't really want that challenged. Uh, they want to keep that they 
being the you know editors publishers one one to keep that and and you know publishers like to ride a wave they don't want like to make a wave and so it was really difficult for me to get this published and now and then I, and now I want to go back to my historical fiction because that's really what I like to write and I happen to know some of the people from your publisher cuz they're in LA and yeah so they are great yeah, unnamed they're press awesome. they're really really great yeah so poetry I actually didn't even call myself a poet or a writer until a couple of years ago when I got serious about writing a book. Because I'm like, once you tell somebody you're writing a book, then you, I guess you have to say you're a poet or a writer. But I remember the first time in Minnesota, and this is back in 2001, that I went to um, a party with, it was like put on by the Adopted Korean Connection there. Uh, it's, similar, it's like a sister organization, I guess, to also known as here in New York. And there was this spoken word group that was all Asian American. Um, one guy was Vietnamese American, another was like 1.5 generation Korean American, and then there was a Korean adoptee. And I really didn't have an opinion, I guess, about poetry at that time, but they were loud, they were good, they were angry about things that I didn't realize I was angry about. Um, and that kind of opened me up to like all these Asian American spoken word artists and poets at the time. I don't know if any of you remember the spoken word group, I Was Born With Two Tongues, Ishel Park, and some of those poets from back in like maybe almost 20 years ago now. And that's what like kind of like inspired me to keep writing. And even still, I wasn't calling myself a poet, but it was something that had connected with me. And so I felt like that was how I could write um, some of my experiences, whether it's you know, following a specific um, literary device, because that's not what I tried to do. Um, but, you know, using poetry as a form of telling truth. That's, uh, I'm digesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of your books address adoption, and I won't reveal in what ways all of them, um, but how has adoption and familial identity shaped the things you write and also your own life? So uh, I will tell you a family secret. My oldest sister is adopted. Um, she doesn't know this. And I suddenly wow. had a rush of adrenaline <laughs> thinking about that. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why she doesn't, uh, and some of it is because um, her, her, an emotional capacity. Um, so this has been the secret that's been in my family from the time that I can remember. And it's a matter, it's, and we keep it a secret as a way to protect her. I don't know if that's um, right, uh, I, I don't know whose decision that was. It was par my parents' decision, but we have all gone along with that decision. And now she's in her late 70s and, you know, um, in diminished capacity. And would it, is there any reason why to, you know, tell her this after her whole life of not knowing it? Um, I think not. But, and so that's where, that's where I stand with that with that decision, but um, it's, it's been a, a lifelong quest, question of do we tell her, do we not tell her, whose, whose story is this? Um, so I don't really know what more to say about that except for it's, a, it's complicated. Adoption's always complicated, yeah. Um, now I, f I totally forgot the question because I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. That's remarkable. Uh, the, the question was, um, how has adoption and familial identity shaped the things you write and your life? Oh, well, it shaped my life um, because I'm adopted, and uh, that's just something that you you know it's it's a label that you have. It's a it's 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 just a fact of your life, and um, 
as I said, I've got three siblings who are the biological children of my white parents, and so I've always been the the odd one out, and it's always been very apparent to everybody that I am adopted. And uh, you know, you get these reactions where my sister would introduce me. This is my sister, and the people would be like, "No, she's not," or "Oh my God, really?" And you know, just like all these. Just, yes, I am, and so shut up. Um, so I think it really made me very um, sort of, in a way, introverted, very secret, very like I'm going to hold on to my own, um, my own inner sense, and I have an outer face, and I have an inner something that's inside me that uh, I don't want to share with other people, and yet I did want to share it. And so I wanted to share it. Uh, through writing, it came it came out in writing. Though it wasn't, you know, just about me or just about adoption, but it was about just like the things that went on in my head, um, which mostly didn't have to do with adoption. But I feel like just because there is kind of that um, that double face that I have, um, that writing helped me to sort of um, socialize that that inner feeling that I have about being adopted. I would totally agree with a lot of things that Alice has said that, you know, that in order for our stories to be out the way, the way that we want them to be, we have to tell them, we have to write them. Um, and so again, I think, you know, we, I've heard a lot in adoption that like, oh, your life is better because you were adopted and you were adopted to America of all places, you know? And, and it's like, well, how do you quantify that? I used to be a high school math teacher, so I want to know, like, how are you going to measure that? Are you saying, like, well, you you can make more money because you were adopted? You know, your income is better. It's like, well, then sh shouldn't that be true for every adoptee? What about the adoptees who've been deported or, you know, different things? So I think it's important to also, like Alice has said, too, it's like there's not just one Korean adoption story. There's not just two. There are 200,000 of us. So there are 200,000 stories. And um, a film project that was launched in May, which some of you may be familiar with, is called Side by Side. It's interviewed 100 overseas adopted Koreans in multiple countries throughout Europe, the US, um, as well as people who aged out of the orphanages system in Korea. It's online right now. It's free. It's called Side by Side, I believe also known as as is going to be doing some events here in New York when it screens here. Um, so I, that's what I've heard anyway. <laughs> February, okay, so keep an eye out for that. But um, again, this is unfiltered, unedited footage of people sitting down with a microphone, some of them for the first time, talking about things that they never felt like they could verbalize. And so, I mean, I, I would encourage people to check that out as well. It's called Side by Side and it's online. Great. Um, thank you for sharing the secret. I also wanted to say that I feel like we're collectively keepers of this profound <laughs> knowledge. <Thank you. laughs> um, how did your, uh, did your sister read the book? Um, how what, did she react? The sister whose story it is? Yes, so she read uh, an early draft and she's read it now, I think, four times. Um, the first time that she really read it she, I told her, this is going to make you upset. You know, you will probably cry because her separation from her uncle was very traumatic for her. And so she read the book and then she said to me, she called me up, she said, I didn't cry, it was great, I loved your book, I didn't cry at all. And then she called me back the next day at the end of the day and she says, I cried all day today. <laughs> so, so, so but, uh, but she's read it since then um, a couple of times, four times total, so and each time she writes to me and she says, this is a pain that has become a part of who I am and I have to accept it. And so she reads it again and she cries again, but she accepts it, so. And my last question before I open it up to the audience is just um, all of your, I don't know how to say this. Um, for your book, I kept looking up there it's so fantastical. There is um, guinea pig plastic surgery and um, you know, 
impromptu vacations that turn into kidnappings. <laughs> um, and then your book talks about, um, I feel like, uh, discussions on North Korea that aren't often discussed in the West or anywhere really, and um, a really complex leaving someone behind because of um, that component of your book. How could you talk a bit about um, the fantastical, surreal, difficult aspects of your books? Um, so I um, thought that the Country, my birth country of Korea was a perfect metaphor for being adopted because it's a divided country. One half of it is, you know, successful westernized uh, story, and the other half is like a dark and unknown territory. And um, so it just seemed like a natural, uh, just natural to place the the that that my protagonist would have to go to North Korea to to face her adoption issues. Um, and I, I, when I read Julian, Julian's um, poems, I just noticed a lot of the same threads in, 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 our, in our very, very different um, books, but we, we, have, we write about some of the, very, the, some of the same themes. Um, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's a trend. <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I can't even think of what I was saying. Um, oh yes, uh, about the about the fantastical. Um, so I did want to make this kind of a commentary, not just on adoption, but on on our society today, our American society, our consumer society, um, the the whole movement to kind of um, be one one, you know, have one uh, model, which is usually the Caucasian model as a, as a model of beauty, all of the um, plastic surgery that's going on in China and Korea and Japan, well, I mean, but especially in Korea. Um, and, um, you know, being a transracial adoption, it, adoptee is kind of a bizarre and surreal experience, and um, North Korea is a bizarre and surreal place. So it just all kind of gel together to to end up in in North Korea but I I again I didn't want to write the same adoption story over and over I wanted to write a story that was different and a story that there is no like magical realism or anything in my story it's all you know it could all happen um, so it was just kind of me taking strange uh, themes that interest me and kind of putting it all together. Um, I guess I think of my, that there's like a DMZ across my body somewhere, like literally. Um, so that, I mean, talking about that, but I also think that like some of the things that I wrote about, you know, these are maybe like in the news or maybe they're not even in the news and maybe they're forgotten because some of my friends have, you know, talked to me about like, people, other um, adoptees in the, that I mentioned in the book that have died, but they said, or that different horrible things happened to them. They said, well, who's Jade? And I said, well, Jade, I think it was Pottery. Her parents were Dutch diplomats in Hong Kong. And when I was living in Korea, I moved back to Korea from 2004 to 2008. And when I was living there, um, this family decided that they no longer, they had adopted her from Korea, but they decided that they no longer could be her adoptive parents. So basically she was going to get relinquished a second time and what, then what we call rehomed. And we, we said, well, well, we'll take her and send her to Korea. We'll take care of her, you know, because we understand what this is like. And I wanted to write that poem because I remember just how the energy that would come up when we talk about her situation. And I, I don't know whatever happened to her. I mean, she's probably, I mean, she's gotta be an adult or close to an adult now. Um, so, and who knows if she even has the same name. Um, but I felt like it's important to honor and preserve some of these stories. Um, and there's so much more that could be added, unfortunately, if you think about the heart children um, that were killed in this, that apparently perished in the a car accident in, in March. And then recently there was uh, four adopted Chinese children in Tennessee that were found in an apparent murder-suicide has not really been reported on. So it's like, why is that? And I feel like it's important to 
you know, as other than a news story to have that story preserved somewhere else. Um, and I think, yes, it is difficult material. I, there were times when, as I was writing, especially that piece, Jealousy, when like the first time I'd read it out loud, I just like would have a meltdown. And, you know, some people will say, and I have said, you know, writing is therapy. But a poet friend of mine, she's like, writing is not therapy. It brings up all this shit. And then, like, I get traumatized by, like, all this stuff I have to deal with. And then I need more therapy. So I, but I do think that writing can be therapeutic. But I think it's important way to process, you know, things that maybe you haven't been able to say. So, like, we did a workshop here with also known as where we just kind of wrote things that maybe we've never said to people before. Maybe we didn't feel like we could say, but to be able to sit in a room of other adoptees of color and you say something that you really wanted to say, but you never thought you could, and then everybody's sitting around the room shaking their head, like in agreement, like that's pretty validating, and I think that's pretty damn important. I'm not a short story writer. That's it. <laughs> I've tried. I can write short stories, but once I get involved with a character, um, it's, it's, it becomes complicated, and it takes a novel to unravel the story for me. Thank you all. Um, and I guess... <laughs> oh. I guess I'll open it up to audience questions. Be brave. Hi, thanks. Um, I have a question for Eugenie. You had mentioned that um, starting from a place of, um, you know, real family history, um, it was a bit difficult or challenging, right? It took several, several years for you to um, turn it into a novel. I was, I was curious, like, what your process was. What was difficult? How did you overcome it? Because I'm dealing with a similar situation. <laughs> it just takes hard work. <laughs> um, I don't have any, I don't really have an answer for you. The, You know, I, I, to be honest, I had, I had help. Um, in order to know what's going to make um, a good dramatic fiction, when you're close to the story, as close to the story as I was, it's hard to see that, because you, you want to you know, tell it like you know it. So I had a fantastic agent who helped me, and a fantastic editor who helped me shape these, these stories, who helped me mostly cut stuff that, you know, didn't, that weren't really contributing to the fictional aspect of the drama. So, um, so, so you know, having, having readers, really integrity readers, was, was very useful. But I think that the, the process itself is a storytelling process. So, if you are a fiction writer, then you know that you have to have a beginning, middle, and end, or there needs to be some dramatic change or something. So in every story, in every family story that I was told and that I wanted to relate, I, tr I tried to find that structure and then relay it that way. Thank you. Um, so I'm not a writer, but um, and this is the first time I've ever been to one of these readings. Um, but I am a Korean adoptee, and I'm just curious about the stories, especially for you two. Um, by writing these uh, books, do you feel like your soul or your spirit has healed, or at least like helped you heal through the process or through the, you know, through your journey in life? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for me it was really important that uh, I provide a different narrative from the narrative that most people um, have about adoption. Um, so 
I don't know if that would be healing, but it was more um, kind of acknowledgement, educational, you know, public ed educational. This is a PSA thing. Um, and, uh, you know, to get out that, that message that we are all different, we all have our own stories, um, and that, um, that that traditional view of adoption is not right. Um, and, you know, that, that as adoptees, we have that right to tell our own story. We have that right. People try to say, you know, try to kind of hush us up and, and, and not let us tell our side of the story for some reason, you know, it's just something that they'd rather hear from somebody else who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. I would say that I think what's, what I've, my own experience and I think I've heard from others is that the silencing of our perspective is very common, not just sometimes in our own families, but just in the adoption narrative period um, and often by white adopters because they want to portray this positive, created a happy family. Um, but I think we also need to acknowledge that when a family is created via adoption, it also means that another family was divided. Um, so I think, you know, when I first started reading my poetry in public, well, I really didn't want to, but um, one of my friends, I read it like one time and then she like told other people that I did this. So then it continued and people would want to come and talk to me about it afterwards. They would want a copy of it or somebody said, well, I need to translate that. And I did not want anything to do with that. Um, I never planned to write a book, but that at that time it was just my way to process, um, especially when I went back to live in Korea because I, I had so many questions about things that just did not make sense. Um, but I think I got to a place where, I don't know if I would say healing, but I got to a place where I was ready to share it with other people. Um, and if it's useful to at least one other person, then it's worth it. And people have said, like one of my friends, she's like, I think it's really courageous and brave that you would share such personal information. I think, I, so well, I think it's kind of weird because I'm a very private person, but I don't feel like the stories now, I mean, it is my, it is my experience, but I think because of the feedback I've gotten from not just Korean adoptees, but Chinese, Vietnamese, that, you know, that things that I've said have resonated with them, I feel like there's more of a collective um, collective anger, collective grief, collective um, story now. And so I don't feel like it's just mine anymore, even though I do acknowledge that everybody has a very, has a very individual experience. Hi. Um, so I, uh, I was surprised to hear about the, the different stories of the, the Korean or uh, just other adoptees who uh, sounds like, like very tragic news stories that didn't make like the mainstream media. So I, I'm wondering um, how you hear about these stories and where we can, those of us who are not in like any you know adoption community, how we can hear about these stories and and be a witness to them and, and honor their stories. Some of it you might not ever hear because it's in private Facebook groups. Um, like if there's a suicide, that's some that's usually how I find out about it. Um, I mean, there was one recent one, but I don't. You know, I'm always like, well, let's. How do you know that they were adopted? Because if it doesn't say, well, they were born in wherever and then adopted by family, but um, and one last year, actually, when I was finishing the manuscript, because um, I, again, I feel like if this can help keep one person from killing themselves, really, that's kind of what it comes down to, is that it's, it's worth it. And I remember I was getting ready to go to writing class, and I saw this Facebook post about um, this Korean adoptee in Minnesota, Daniel, who had committed suicide. And really, that's how I found out about it. I mean, it's, and it's because so many of my connections on social media are adoptees. Um, so I don't, I don't really know how to answer that question, but I mean this 
recent one where the Chinese adoptees, I don't know why it's not been reported on more. Um, I mean, it, it's a mystery to me, but um, now you know about it and you can find at least one story online and share it and, you know, maybe help create some awareness. And I think also, you know, that not knowing where to find these stories goes back to that adoptees aren't really that in control of their narrative yet. There's, there are all these uh, other, you know, the mainstream media doesn't really cover it that much. And um, it's just not something that other people seem to find important. In fact, there's a film, I think it's a comedy starring and produced by Mark Wahlberg right now called Instant Family. And if you just search hashtag Instant Family on Twitter, you will find quite a debate. Um, I'm sure I have a problem. I've, saw, I've seen the trailer. I don't plan, I don't know that I'm going to take the time to see it, but I think it's really problematic to make a comedy out of, you know, adoption, you know, and I think it's, yeah, we, we see that I think too much as well, that it's our stories are used. I actually heard also, I don't know the name of the film, but at a recent Asian American film festival that there was a short that was produced by some non-adopted Asian Americans. The main character was an adoptee and again, kind of poking fun. I think this part of the story was that who the adoptee dated ended up being a biological relative, but when you're adopted, you don't always know those things, which is why you should get DNA testing <laughs> if you're doing a birth family search. Even if you're not, you maybe should. I haven't done it yet, though. But, I mean, the very fact that somebody would use our situation to benefit themselves in that way, I've, and, and fellow Asian Americans, I find that really kind of problematic. So, again, why I think it's important for us to, to take control of that narrative more and more. Hello, uh, thank you for sharing your stories and your, also your personal histories. Um, and so I've been hearing a lot of themes of estrangement and disillusionment and alienation with family, but I feel like those themes could also easily be uh, applied to country and the United States, um, especially as Asian Americans and we are constantly trying to assert our Americanness and our mm, our ability to belong here, but at the same time, we're also questioning, well, what is it that brought our families here? What is it that, why is it that we are living here? And so how do you reconcile those two divides? I think it's a, a, a personal struggle for each individual, each immigrant family, not just Asian American, but all immigrant families uh, face this question. It's like, how is it that I'm here and how do I belong here? Um, so I don't think that there can be an, an answer really to that question. I think it's... Um, so personal and so interfamilial as well. Um, each Asian, each Asian American immigrant experience is unique, just like each adoptee experience is unique. So, I think it's impossible to make a blanket answer, you know. But um, I know for myself, the uh, I never having that identity issue when I was young was, was a big struggle, um, but, and I didn't, I always identified American more than Asian until I started to write. And then that's when I reclaimed that, that Asian part of myself. Um, and also then as a result of that, reclaimed my, my family um, and, and my family of origin. So I had no interest in going to Korea until I started to write. And I started to write later in life, too. So, um, so yeah. So, write. That's my answer. 
Yeah, I think, right, or, and, and tell your own story and, you know, be your own voice and uh, be, be your, per be yourself. I mean, you're not, you're not just an Asian American, right? You, you are, you, you're individual, but, you know, just whenever you get the opportunity to just talk about you as an individual, not as, not you as, you know, a whole demographic, but your story, what it means to you to be Asian, what it means to you to be American, um, and just tell anybody who will listen. I don't know that there's anything for me as an individual to reconcile because I didn't choose to come here. I was forced. I, I look at my migration to this country as forced through the institution of adoption. Um, so I think there's more though for Korea to reconcile and for the United States to reconcile because of how things have been mishandled with the thousands of people that don't have citizenship. So I think that there's a reckoning that needs to happen there. And I think it's in process, but I don't think it's moving fast enough. Um, I think I just finished reading um, Elaine Kim's book on Asian American literature, and this is written in the 80s, but she does a historical and um, contextual look at Asian American literature and how it evolved. And first, you know, it was non-Asians, usually white, writing our stories, which probably wasn't really great. But then it was, you know, it just this evolution, and then all of the, like, trailblazer writers that came along that said, you know, Asian American literature is going to be a thing. And Sean Wong was one of those. I got to meet him this fall, and it was just like this epic moment. But I just think all of the Korean, if we're focusing on Korean writers, you know, some of the people that I read when I was, you know, after I'd gone back to Korea, first, that nothing to do with adoption, um, but still were able to give me kind of insights into what does it really mean to be Korean and let me decide that for myself. Because I think I've long claimed that I am 100% Korean and I am 100% American. And that's not for anybody to decide except for me. But I mean, there's some, some great writers like Don Lee, um, Heli Lee, some of the poets I loved were Ed Bok Lee, um, Dennis Kim, Ishel Park. Um, I think they all have YouTube videos up somewhere, you know what I mean? But I play those over and over and over again because even if it's not my story, there's something really beautiful about it. and you know, them having the attention of an audience and wanting to hear our stories. Last question. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, for those of those two that were that are Korean adoptees, when you began to learn more about Korea and when you went back and lived in Korea, were there anything that you felt like, oh, that, that feels natural to me, or oh, so that part of me, that feels really Korean. Were there any that sort of um, discoveries for you? I mean, talking about culture and heritage, are you born with some of that, or you know, do you have to live in it to really understand it and feel it? I think, you know, in the, I went back for the first time in 2001, then I moved back in 2004. And when I went in 2001, you know, a lot of us were saying, our group was like overseas adopted Koreans, not just from the US, but all over Europe, Australia. And so like the first day to sit there at breakfast and sit across from the table from somebody who looks like many of you and who had a similar experience and could have ended up in my situation but who spoke with a European pronunciation or Australian, that is kind of mind blowing. And now it's just very normal for me. Um, but I know a lot of people said like, when I was, when I'm in Korea, I feel very American. When I'm in America, I feel very Korean. Um, and I think it, again, it's a very individual journey. When I was living there, and one of the reasons I wanted to live there was I was, when I went back in 2001, I was there in the summer. And if you've been there in the summer, it's nonstop humidity. It's, you know, the monsoon. It's not a fun time weather-wise to go. So there were simple things I wanted to know, just like, what is it like to be in Korea and need a sweater? I mean, it's something as simple as that. I wanted to know, how do Koreans celebrate Christmas? 
I wanted to know what is, I wanted to go through all the seasons because people always talk about like the change of seasons in Korea. So it was simple things like that, just being able to experience, but knowing I can never like recapture all the years that were lost. Um, there were times where, you know, I felt very proud to be Korean, um, but there were also times where, and still, where I'm very ashamed of how Korea has, has operated, I guess. Um, but I don't, I mean, the first time I ate Korean food as an adult was in Minnesota. It was at an adoptee event. And there is no poem about this, but I'm going to write something about it because it was a very traumatic experience. I don't think, I don't even remember what language the menu was in. It was in Minnesota, so there was probably some English on there. I had no idea what the fuck was on that menu. I was like, what is this? I'm, supposed, I'm Korean, so I'm supposed to know. And like, I'm sure there's this thing called kimchi on there. So I just, somebody's like, well, there's this thing called the hot stone bibimbap, the dosok bibimbap. So I was like, okay, that's a popular dish and it doesn't sound too threatening. Well, then it comes out with this fried egg on it. And I was like, what the hell is this? Well, like, I had no idea how to eat it. And it was like, I just stood there and froze and, and stared at it. So my friend sat across the table from me and reached across, took the bottle of the red pepper paste, a gochujang, and squirted it on there, stirred it up. And then the egg was like, you know, all mixed in. And she's like, there, now it's ready to eat. And I was like, it is? You know, I mean, I think it's things like that, that I didn't grow up seeing and knowing how Korean food is made and eaten. I didn't know you're supposed to wash your rice before you cook it. All those things, like, there's no class for that. Or if there is a Korean cooking class, I feel like it's always kind of very condescending to adoptees. Um, so I don't, I think it's just navigating the culture to make it fit for what works for me and take from it what I want? Um, I, I grew up uh, not in America. I, first li I lived in a country called Botswana um, in Southern Africa. There were, you know, three or four East Asians there. Um, so I really didn't see another Asian person until uh, I was in sixth grade. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, I, I was adopted in 1968, and that was just a few years after they actually started letting Asians into the country. And so there were, uh, there was nobody in, in my school, um, in, even in high school, there were maybe 10 Asian kids. Now you go to that high school and, you know, it's, 20%, but um, I just didn't have any of those, um, of the, I didn't have any experience with being Asian. Um, so uh, when I was in high school, I started to study Chinese, and I went to China when I was in, in college to, for a study abroad program, and that was the first time that, you know, I was surrounded by other Asian faces, and I both loved it and I hated it, because China's uh, kind of a difficult place to live. And it was, you know, I went there in 88, so that was pretty early. Um, and it was just, it was, it was, it was an incredible experience, um, but it was kind of also like, wow, you know, Asia's a really different place. Um, and I didn't really think about Korea very much. I, I've only been to Korea, um, besides being born there, uh, twice, once for one day, uh, when I was going from China back home. And then uh, once, when I went with my family, we lived in Japan and we went for a week to Korea. And, you know, I have to say that I didn't very much feel uh, any, anything. Um, I, liked, I liked the countryside, uh, I liked the culture and the experience, but it wasn't like, wow, these are my people, and oh, that's why I do this, or you know, that's why I like spicy food. Um, it, there's, there was just kind of like this disconnect and, and I felt more of an affinity with the Chinese and the Japanese cultures than I did with the Korean culture. And I think that also has a lot to do with that Korean culture in America really hasn't come into, into um, public consciousness except for very recently with K-pop. Um, it's just Korea's like the forgotten uh, Asian culture. Um, so. Yeah, I just, I feel like I am 100% American. I, I'm interested in Korea. I would love to go back there. I don't know if I'd like to live there. Um, I, I, I think I do have a, 
a certain amount of resentment against the country, you know, um, that has that has exported their their unwanted babies um, and not tried to. Even today, I don't think that they're they're really trying to face that. Um, so yeah, I've got really ambivalent feelings about Korea. Well, thank you. Um, one more round of applause.